Hello and welcome to my little trip down road testing memory lane. Now, thanks very much for all your questions and comments, all the videos um, recently, really appreciated. Um, and today I'm gonna to answer some of those questions. So let's crack straight on with the first one from Dean Marshall. Um, hello Dean, thanks for the question. Looking at various sport classics still, that's the Ducati sport classic. Uh, and a local dealer has thrown a new Street Triple Moto 2 into the mix. Different bikes, of course, but about the same price. The Moto 2 looks like it would be huge fun, and the Sport Classic looks great, sounds great, and would also no doubt be fun on the road, but in a different way. If you get a moment to follow up on this, which would you choose and why? Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Two very, very different bikes. So. We've spoken about the Sport Classics before. These are the the, the simple kind of air-cooled um, V-twins that Ducati produced in the, the mid-noughties, um, kind of 70s style. Beautiful bikes, very light, very punchy, very simple. But they were kind of marketed as uh, old people's bikes at the time, kind of uh, separate from Ducati's sport bike range, you know. If you're too old for sports bikes, get one of these. And uh, they never really sold. And then Ducati stopped making them just before the retro boom started. So it was really bad timing. And um, Ducati do uh, the Scrambler now, which uh, is okay, but it's, it's no sport classic. So it's a shame they don't make them again. Um, by today's standards, they're still really nice bikes, but you know, they're like any retro really. They're they're really nice, evocative motorcycles that you can ride on a Sunday morning. They go well, they handle well, but they're kind of for, if for taking it easy, really, just for enjoying the scenery and enjoying the motorcycle for what it is, which is really the polar opposite to the, the Street Triple Moto 2. So this, this is a Triumph that's come out this year. It's based on the new Street Triple uh, 765 uh, RS. So the Moto2 is not to be confused with the, the Daytona 765 Moto2 that came out a few years ago. That was a, basically an old Daytona with a street triple engine thrown in, into it. Uh, carbon fiber fairing it was about 15 grand at the time. Made in limited numbers, really lovely to ride, but probably not worth the money. It wasn't finished that great. Um, yeah. It kind of played on their Moto2 kind of involvement, but as a as a 15 grand motorbike, it didn't really work. But this Street Triple Moto2 is basically the new Street Triple 765 RS, which is brilliant. Have a look on uh, MCN's YouTube channel and uh, MCN's web reviews to see exactly what we thought of it. But you know, in many ways, it's it's the 21st century super sport bike. Obviously, people don't buy true super sport bikes anymore. You know, like we've, we've talked about in previous videos, sports bikes aren't to everyone's taste anymore. And a super sport naked is more the way people are going, if you want that kind of thing, because they're, they're comfortable, they're easy to ride, and they're, they've still got fantastic performance. And we rode that Street Triple 765 at its launch a few months ago around Hereth Circuit. Absolutely amazing for that. Uh, and on the road as well. But the Moto2 edition uh, has got a few more fancy bits, but the main difference is it's got clip-ons. So it's kind of like a cafe racer more than a, a naked. Um, we didn't get to ride it. I'd absolutely love to ride it. Um, the, the sort of closest thing I've ridden to that kind of thing would be maybe the, in sort of spirit anyway, the MV Augusta, Brutale 1000RR, um, which is a super naked with clip-ons, which is quite unusual because super nakeds are normally got straight bars. Um, it's actually an uncomfortable bike to ride. You've got all the downsides of a sports bike, really. So I would say, unless you're going to do loads of track days, I'd get the normal Street Triple 765 RS because um, it's a more comfortable road bike. If you're going to do a load of track days, that Moto2 would make perfect sense and make that bike handle even better because you've got more weight over the front end and it give you a lot more feel and a lot more speed through the corners. You can hunker down a little bit more, but of course it still hasn't got a fairing, so you're still going to be quite exposed. But 
I would say to enjoy on the road, if you can find a good one, the Ducati Sport Classic is going to be the one to go for, or a standard Street Triple 765 RS or R. The R is a slightly lower spec version, slightly softer, doesn't feel much different to the RS on the road to be honest. And um, if you can kind of do away with the, the blingy chassis components, that's a fantastic bike as well. So there you go, Dean. Good question. Right, the next is from Michael S. Thanks for your question. Um, so I think we're talking about, this is a response to the video we did on uh, the tyre test that MCN do. And in fact, I've just done a tyre test with Ride Magazine, which you can see in their up and coming issue, where we tested a group of sports touring tyres, the six sort of main players, and we had the perfect conditions. We It rained all day, consistent rain on the road. We did a blind test. We did it on a Suzuki GSX S1000 GT, which is the perfect bike for that. Um, and because the conditions were consistent the whole way through, it was cold all the way through, not pleasant riding, not the kind of riding you'd normally want to do on a road test, but for a tire test, absolutely spot on. Um, and you can see which tires did what, how they performed in that test. I won't give the game away, but one tire was head and shoulders better than the other. And um, me and Matt Wildy, the ride editor, both said the same thing. Our opinions on some of the other tires were slightly different, um, but the winner was, was um, yeah, it was an outright winner. But anyway, I digress. Uh, trouble is for most bikers, we wanna know what tires feel like between 1,000 and 4,000 miles in. All new tires feel great, but how long do they feel great for? I've found Metzler and Michelin have the best longevity. Pirelli after a thousand miles, I can feel traction control intervention more often, but how does anyone test a 3000 miles, all conditions? Um, I'd love to see a sports naked bike test on wet roads in the winter as on dry, hot or track grip. Track grip is so close between the tires, it's not a result that bears much value to the life cycle of the tires. So I think you're saying there, it'd be more relevant to do a tire test in the normal road wet conditions. Well, we've just done that with ride, as I, as I say. Um, but yeah, the other point is, you wanna know how the tires feel when they're well worn. Well, to do a standalone test like that is almost impossible for a magazine to do anyway, because it costs so much money. So tire manufacturers do that. And we've been to one that springs to mind, a Dunlop tire launch. Um, I can't remember what tire it was where they give their tire to a proper testing agency. And the testing agency take that tire and they take all the competitors tire tires and they do a longevity test, a mileage test, where they have a big, big old route, obviously. Not only do they have a big route, they have different bikes to test the tires on. They have different riders to test the tires on at different times of day. Um, through the you know different conditions and it kind of just evens out all the inaccuracies that would happen if you try to do a, a smaller test so for example if you were to try or let's say um, MCN's long-term test fleet it's it's one of the jobs of the people that run the long termers to to try tires um, and they'll they'll feel what those tires like through the the course of the tires life I do the same with my long termers but obviously that feel you get, the mileage you get is very specific to that one particular rider and their one style and where they ride and what bike they've got. And it's hard to duplicate that to somebody else. Someone else would have a different experience. So, you know, you even see it on track days or even on road bikes. You would think that a faster rider wears a tire out quicker than a slower rider. Sometimes that's the case, but sometimes it isn't because a slower rider would generally break more into a corner and then they'll accelerate sooner through the corner because they're not running corner speed. So there's more, the tire's going through more on and off throttle stress rather than a nice kind of floating kind of riding style. It's the same on track. Maybe a lesser experienced rider would stay in a corner for longer 
carry loads of lean, get on the throttle, get the tire moving and losing grip. Whereas a more experienced rider would go in faster, stop, carry a lower mid corner speed, turn the bike and come out. And they'd be stressing the tire less on the side, even though they'd be stressing it more when it's more upright. So it's almost impossible really to, um, to sort of test tires in that kind of middle zone between there being new and being completely knackered out really. Um, but you know, many new generation tires do keep their consistency all the way through and they keep their character all the way through. And one thing we found during tire tests is that the outright grip of all the latest and greatest tires isn't actually that different. It's more about the confidence the tires give you, how quick they warm up, how comfortable they are with the ride quality, how they feel under braking, how they feel under acceleration. You know, it's more of a feeling thing than an outright grip thing because, you know, unless you're a TT rider, you'll never stress a tire on the road. It's all about how they feel and, and what kind of confidence they give you. So um, I don't know if I've answered that, <laughs> but really that's one of the conundrums about tire testing. Um, like I said before, they're very expensive to do. So, um, you know, the fact we did this ride test in those conditions is a bit of a, a kind of a golden moment. It was completely independent. We, we had the tires, um, sent in from retailers they were fitted by a mobile tire man and uh, we just went out and rode them all day so that's a really interesting test so um, have a look out for that but thank you very much for your uh, question Michael so next one from Charlie Lydeth and easy I'm going on my first bike tour in May mm, that's now um, I'll be solo on my Monster 1200S riding from the UK to southern Italy I've actually just done a similar thing. I've just come back, hence the old Jackie Chan. Um, besides the obvious that I might have already read about, do you have any tips, advice, which are more outside the box? Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Um, well, going on a bike tour down to Southern Italy is one of the nicest things you can do. I mean, the trip I've just done, um, we went over the Alps, down into Lake Como, I mean, the lakes are fantastic. Down through Italy, Tuscany, down to Rome, Naples, um, carried on from there. Well, we would have carried on from there, but um, the bike got stolen. But that's another story for another day. Um, but as far as tips goes, um, one tip is to get a um, toll pass for the French motorways. They're Sanef. Um, toll passes or the little um, sort of um, little plastic um, transponder things. I black tack mine to my bike so when you're going through tolls the tolls just open automatically and then you get a bill for it the next month. That's really really handy. Um, so you have to stop and take your gloves off and get your tickets out and your credit cards and everything like that. So that's really handy. Um, I don't do the same for Italy just um, because I try and avoid the, the, the motorways in Italy more than anything. And uh, you're sort of in France more than Italy on some of those trips anyway. So but anyway, that would be my first um, tip. Um, I always book hotels on the whole route round, just because I'm a bit OCD. I don't think I could um, stand the pressure of getting hotels as you go along because obviously they're less likely to be uh, available. Um, and then if they can't find any hotels, you've got to ride to the next town, then the next town, and it gets a little bit stressful. So I book all my hotels way before I go. And then, you know, you've got a destination then each day, you know, and you can plan the rest of your day around it, really. I'd normally ride from about nine to four, generally, which is maybe between two and 300 miles, depending on, on the route you're going. Um, and then I always carry some chain cleaner with me and a rag, I take GT85. So at the end of every day, I just wipe the chain over with GT85 and clean the chain. Um, just, you know, a stitch in time saves nine and all that. It doesn't take two seconds to clean your chain when you get off the bike. Um, and then that just keeps it from getting rotten during the trip. So I always carry a can of GT85 with me and a cloth. 
Um, I luggage. I mean, you don't want to overload yourself with luggage. I mean, on a sort of a solo trip like that, I guess a tank bag and a and a rucksack is all you need. Um, heavy small stuff in the tank bag, um, and light big stuff in the rucksack, so you can't feel it. Um, and yeah, that's about it, really. Just um, go before you start the trip. Go with as good a tire as you can, because obviously that's a long way. You don't want to run out of tire before you get back. Make sure you've got plenty of brake pads for the trip, and um, just make sure you know your bike's well serviced and and up for the job. But that sounds absolutely fantastic. And of course, take a lock with you. So uh, I would say generally Europe is pretty safe, but there are some places, Naples, where it's not. So um, you know if you're going to leave your bike for out of your sight for any period of time, then then definitely lock it. You know, obviously lugging a massive lock around with you probably isn't a great idea, but um, you know, if you get one of them like cable locks or something like that, they'll do the job. But unfortunately, if someone really wants your bike, they'll cut through anything and throw the bike in the back of the van. So, you know, just park sensibly really where it's kind of out in the open where, you know, people are gonna be put off tampering with it. Stick it in hotel car parks where you can, you know underground public car parks whatever you know manned ones um and yeah just enjoy yourself so uh thanks very much charlie next is uh from rage rider another great vid thank you very much rage rider really interesting as ever i have a question about born again bikers as i am one for context i haven't ridden for 13 years but i've decided to get back into it this year so what are your top tips for someone returning to biking after a while out predominantly regarding safety, as I understand that uh, they're the group most likely to have a serious accident. And also, if your name's Rage Rider. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, I suppose, you know, tips for born again bikers are the same really as if you just spend a little layoff, you know, a winter off your bike or something like that. I mean, it's slightly different. I suppose for a born again biker, you're gonna be getting a, a new bike. So, choose choose your bike carefully you know don't be tempted to go for you know big power big weight necessarily you know a lot of born again bikers maybe go for big heavy harleys and, and realize they're quite difficult and tricky to ride or really powerful r ones and realize that having lots of power is a liability on a bike it does actually take away a lot of enjoyment unless you're absolutely flat out on the track so you know, a, a nice, light, easy to ride bike um, is a good tip. You know, if you wanted to get, you know, and all the retro bikes are really good for first time riders. The middle weights are fantastic. Middleweight nakeds, whether they're the kind of the soft ones like Hornets or the Larry ones like MT09s and 890 Jew cars. Those kind of bikes are fantastic. Trident 660 uh, Sports, oh no, 660 Sport Triumphs or Trident 660s. Um, I mean, there's such an array of fantastic bikes now. We're really spoiled. I mean, you know, we sort of lament the passing of sports bikes, but now sports bikes have kind of almost gone. The the choice out there is fantastic. It's a great choice. And um, so that's why I say, first of all, you know, your bike. Um, I'd, you know, go out on your own for a little while. Don't be tempted to go out with mates where, you know, there'll always be one that's fast and kind of wants to show off and you might feel the need to try and keep up or whatever you know it's hard to switch off a male ego isn't it um but yeah just just go out and take your time and do your own thing and you know i always repeat the mantra that uh, one of our road testers bruce dunn always says to me he goes at the end of the day it doesn't matter just go on your own pace if someone's faster than you it really doesn't matter just just do your own thing you know and also it's good to soak up riding tips ding like a like a sponge um and you know there's there's some great riding tips videos out there we've done a load for mcn you know how to sit on the bike how to approach corners your state of mind all that kind of stuff so yeah i mean just to jump out ignore bikes all week and then go out on a sunday then ignore it again probably isn't the best way to ride you kind of got to immerse yourself in biking a little bit 
you know, watch lots of videos, as you're doing anyway, um, taking that riding advice, choose the right bike, do your own thing and ride at your own pace and, you know, just, just enjoy it, just enjoy it. So, uh, well, you'd have to let me know what you get and where you go. But thanks very much, Rage Rider. Right, this one is from Camelot57. My brother owns the 1200 Multistrada, your colleague John Westlake wrote off back in the day. Yeah, John Westlake at the time was uh, the editor of Bike Magazine and he had a bit of an accident near Garantham on it, which I think, I think he broke his back or something like that. I mean, he's fully fit now, but it was a pretty dodgy old accident during a photo shoot, I think. Oh, well, we all make mistakes. Now, over the years, I've read some great articles from Jake great journalists like Dave Minton, John Robinson, Martin Harrison, Colin Schiller, and you good self, thanks very much. Um, who past and present do you hold in the highest esteem? Well, a very good question. Well, I suppose I, um, like many people of my advancing years, we started buying motorbike magazines in the late 80s and early 90s. The people I just couldn't get enough of reading were, to begin with, Matt Oxley, and he still writes fantastic articles now on MotoGP. Mark Forsyth, because his kind of story was so interesting. He was a, a, a racer journalist as well, really good sense of humour. Rupert Paul, you know, one of the cleverest man, men on planet Earth. John Robinson, as you say, and that, that kind of core of PB crew I really used to enjoy. And then as, as the years evolved, Simon Hargreaves from PB and you know is still doing journalism now for Bennett's and um, doing his front end chatter podcast as well. Trevor Franklin was a fantastic writer who I had the honour and pleasure of working with for a long time at MCN. He's now gone freelance now and um, no he's a PR man now um, but he was a fantastic writer and then kind of of, of the the modern group really, Martin Fitzgibbons was a fantastic writer and I think I've said to you before, I sat next to him when I was working at MCN and you can almost hear his brain <laughs> pulsing because he's so clever. Um, and kind of a, away from that, I don't read a lot of other stuff other than motorbikes really, it's just bikes, 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 but um, who else would it be? I suppose that's about it now but of course we've kind of evolved into the video age haven't we so um you know i love love watching bike videos as well you know some of my favorites is um i've just got into that uh, fort nine um and he's absolutely superb um the 44 teeth crew billy bolt really like him and then some of the car stuff as well tyrell's classic workshop because that's just geek central harry's um harry's garage because he's a geek, but yeah, yeah. But I'd say those old early '90s um, bike journalists are, are really who I've always a, a aspired to, really. And um, yeah, but there's still some great ones around today, and magazines are still going strong. Just. <laughs> but thanks for your question. Right. Okay. This is from TA. Um, Dear Michael, are there any manufacturers who invite feedback partway through a bike's development? Have you ever been involved in this? Have any adjustments been made because of this feedback or after, or after the press have reported on a bike, have manufacturers made changes then? Dave Moss Suspension Guy did a survey of new bikes from a variety of manufacturers and tested to see the suspension settings as they left the showroom floor. They could be all over the place. Do manufacturers have quality control to make sure these things are set up correctly? Oh, interesting. Thanks, TA. Um, are there any manufacturers who invite feedback partway through a bike's development? No. <laughs> it's a simple answer. Um, the development phase of a motorbike is pretty long. Um, you know, I know that some manufacturers kind of have a, a numbered system for their, their prototypes. So I guess they, they start off with like a prototype zero and that bike would be the kind of the very, very first draft of that bike. So, you know, that bike will be fresh off the drawing board, made of, made of old bits of uh, Meccano and, um, and duct tape probably. 
and that will be as rough as they come to try and kind of establish the general concept of the bike you know the geometry that kind of stuff and then there'll be like a prototype one where that bike is a little bit more a little bit less rough rough and ready and maybe a prototype two and three and kind of a final prototype something like that i mean all this information the manufacturers keep obviously quite close to their their chests um and i guess the sort of the fundamental changes are made in those early prototype stages which could be some you know could be between two to five years before they actually come out um so you know if any any feedback you'd kind of give in the latter stages it would almost be too late because they're just really putting the icing on the cake at that point so you know we we never get involved with uh, with that unfortunately um but i think we should sometimes because you know not every bike is perfect and as we've said before that kind of every bike could be perfect because every manufacturer knows how to make a great bike and every manufacturer's test rider knows what a great bike should feel like but sometimes they're not great because they're restricted on time and price or f the company's philosophy or politics or whatever and they can't make the bike they really want um none of none of what we ever say at a launch i never see in the next model any criticism just because the next model is so far or has been produced really but when you go to a launch of a new bike the new model probably would be almost the next model probably almost be finished so there's not really much they could do anyway um yeah but it'd be nice if um we always some manufacturers give you a feedback form and um you know i haven't done this job for quite a long time um you know if you've got manufacturer x and you've you've you've, you've filled out your feed feedback form and said what you really think about it um but then they bring out the next model and you've got exactly the same criticism the next model the same criticism the next one the next one so i don't really know why they ask for feedback to be honest because they could look at the the reviews as well but um now i wish they would i wish they'd kind of get normal normal people in to ride their bikes because you know sometimes um test riders are, are too good you know i remember speaking to one test rider and who, who was new to test riding he was an ex-racer and he said that all the test riders would go up and down these mountains in Spain, skidding the bikes into corners, wheeling out the corners, and not riding in the way that the customers would ride. They'd, they'd miss out a whole chunk of what the customer would feel because they're riding at such a high level. And, you know, they can't understand what it means to be a little bit nervous on a motorbike or a little bit scared or a little bit steady. And sometimes when you, you know, if you've got less experience and you ride like that, you find problems in a motorbike that... Harry Dash Wheelie King would never would never see so it's an interesting one and I think yeah I think they should I'm up for uh, any any work like that <laughs> anyway thanks very much for your question uh, TA it's a really good one right next one is from Jeff Smith on my 1000 XR the previous owner had put Michelin Pilot Road 4 GTs on my bike I think they're designed for a more heavier bike really which makes me question the heat that gets into them being a lighter bike the heat that gets into them being a lighter bike they feel a bit skittish i can only imagine they thought they could get more miles out of them which may be the case but i can't help th thinking grip is compromised any thoughts on this thanks very much jeff well yeah in the um, in the sports tour entire world you get generally two versions of a rear tyre for any given model. So in this case for Michelin's Pilot Road 4s, which are a couple of generations old now, they're up to six, there's a GT version. And a GT version will basically be a double, double ply or double thickness tyre um, designed to suit heavy bikes. So, you know, if you think of sports touring tyre, you could put that on anything from an MT-07 to a k1600 gt obviously you know that the sports touring tire would be okay up until a point where the bikes get really really heavy and then the bikes just squash the tires down you know that's what happens so for those heavier bikes you fit the the heavier tires and they're physically heavier they're um yeah they're designed to take the weight probably probably a bit less sporty than the the lighter version 
Um, but if you put the wrong tire on the wrong bike, you're gonna, there's gonna be a problem. So if you put the lighter tire on a heavy bike, the bike's gonna kind of be squidgy, probably less stable than it could be. And then vice versa, if you put the heavy tire on a lighter bike, um, you might run into some problems. I don't think they'd ever be dangerous. Uh, the manufacturers would probably put, um, you know, measures into place where it wouldn't matter if you made a mistake and put in the wrong tire, but you wouldn't get the performance you need anyway. So yeah, I mean, carry on and, and use them. I mean, <laughs> they might not wear out for ages, but yeah, when it, when it comes to replacing them on the XR, definitely get normal um, sports touring tires because the XR isn't really considered a, a heavy bike by the manufacturers. Still quite a, it's like a super bike on stilts really, isn't it? But sports touring tires are definitely still the best kind of tires for that bike anyway, especially the latest generation that almost feel like sports tires anyway. So anyway, um, I think you'll be all right riding them, but um, yeah, get them changed anyway, because when you can, because the new generation, you know, road sixes are really good anyway. So anyway, thanks very much, Jeff. Next, um, from Paulie G, the, um, thanks for your question. Really interesting to learn the development history. Oh, this is of the, um, the BMW S1000RR video I did. I own a Gen 4 and love it. Never quite understood why the current bike doesn't perform as it should in BSB or WSB. It has always been the bike to beat in the stock classes and obviously the TT, but no one has yet to make, to, no one has yet made it work consistently in the premium classes. Brad Ray hinted at the fact the bike is difficult to set up to get a good base setting when he raced it. What are your thoughts? Well, thanks Paulie. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I mean, in super stock class, you really get to see a road bike in its kind of best state, really. It's still pretty standard, but you've got, none of the components are built down to a price like they are on a road bike. So, you know, you can fit proper suspension, proper shock in the rear, proper fork internals, um, good tires, proper gearing, proper brakes, proper electronics. So, you know, you really get to see which bike is the best really. Um, but as you start stepping up a level, it gets a little bit more cloudy because when you see bikes whizzing around a track on TV, you never know the story of them. You know, and also they're so close. You know, if one bike's winning and one bike's finishing 15th, there might be less than a second in it. You know, there's not actually, you know, the, the one in 15th is a bad bike. It's just that the one in first is just, they've just got it right. And, you, you know, having a, a race winning bike is as much down to the team. It's as much down to how much knowledge there is in the team, how, how good the data engineer is how much money they've got to spend, how much testing they've done, what kind of rider they've got. Almost a good team could make any bike work, um, down to a point, obviously. Um, but obviously the base bike's got a pretty heavily, heavily uh, heavy influence. But then that said, even a world super bike, you can cut and shut the frame, take all the, the bracing out of it, put bracing in it, you can completely change the engine internals. You can kind of almost make it a different bike. Um, obviously kind of the, the basic geometry is, is fixed, which is why manufacturers bring out homologation specials. Um, I think the, one, of, one of the reasons Ducati are winning in World Superbike at the moment is because they've got the best base bike. They've got the most modern base bike, which was um, revised last year, 2022. So their bike starts on a much higher level than the Yamahas and the and the uh, Kawasaki's and the BMWs. I mean, BMW have kind of almost, always gone down their own path, really. I mean, do you remember in the kind of the Haslam Melandry days, I think 2010, 11, 12, or 12, something like that. You know, a lot of the technology came from Formula One with electronics and throttles and stuff like that. And the bikes were unrideable because of that, because you need a bit more finesse with the throttle. Um, but, you know, you've got, someone like Yamaha who are just used to creating road bike uh, road bikes and race bikes and their electronics are a little bit different so it's really hard to say why one bike wins and one bike doesn't at that level but I think it's a lot more than the actual bike itself it's a lot of it's to do with everything that surrounds it but I think that the BMW is quite finicky 
I mean, even at a low, a low level, you know, club racing, when I've done Thundersport and, and MRO power bike before, you know, I've seen people move from BMWs to R1s and suddenly they're winning just because they're sort of easier bikes to ride. BMWs are generally quite stiff and snappy in stock form anyway. And a little bit angry as well. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough to ride some of the factory super bikes and stuff. And the, the DNA is, is quite similar between the race bike and the road bike. They're, they're a little bit angry. Um, you know, the fastest bikes are the easiest bikes to ride. You know, you ride a new 2023 Panigale now. And the way the electronics work, it's just so easy. An R1 is so easy. And, and some of that's got to translate into racing as well. So maybe that's what it is. But who knows? That is the that is the, yeah that is the million dollar question. You just never know when you're watching the TV what the story is. You know even you know even the racing I do. Sometimes you you know you do guest rides in one make uh, series, and you imagine the guest bike would be the best one on the grid, but it's actually not. It's the one that's left unloved between races, and is normally rubbish <laughs> when you go to ride it. Um, but yeah. That is a very good question, but thanks very much, Paulie. Um, and I think we've just got time for one more. Right, final ones from uh, Dave Wilson. With the 800 verse thousands, I guess it's MotoGP. Um, is it the rotating mass of the engine that aids corner speed or the actual weight of the bike? Um, laugh out loud, I'm a soft lad and only owned 800s, loving this series. Well, thanks very much, David Wilson. Um, very good question. Yeah, I guess that's, um, do you remember when um, uh, MotoGP went from thousands to, to 800s, suddenly the corner speed rose and uh, the crashes are actually faster because they're going through corners faster, you know, bringing it back a level, 600s are faster through corners than thousands, 400s are faster through corners than 600s, 125s are faster through corners. And so, you know, I'd say the, the rotating mass of the engine probably more changes the speed in which the bike turns and how easy the bike is to turn. Not so much the corner speed. I would say that the reason the smaller bikes carry more corner speed is because they can, number one, because they can spend more time at full lean on the edge of the tire and when you come to accelerate, it doesn't upset the, the bike and the tire grip so much. Um, and the riding style is different. So to get a big, powerful thousand around a racetrack, you want to go into the corner really fast and stop almost, turn and then come out fast. So you're deliberately not carrying corner speed. Because if you do carry corner speed and they're perfectly able to carry corner speed, if you're stuck at full lean for too long, you can't use all the bike superpowers. So, you know, you've got to get it stood up as fast as you can. So that style for thousands has kind of evolved from 500s, I suppose, where they go in, stop, turn and fire out. Whereas a 250, you need to carry your corner speed to get through the corner and then just ma maintain momentum, which is why you need the corner speed. I mean, the engine obviously has something to do with that. The, the wheel sizes, smaller bikes generally have smaller wheels. So again, they're more agile. Um, they've got smaller tires as well. Um, so yeah, big clumsy thousands need to be stop and started, you know, with their big old fat tires and uh, yeah, ridden in a certain way. Um, the most fun way, I mean, if you get the hang of a thousand around a racetrack and do the old point and squirt thing, it is, it is very, very rewarding. It's amazing. And in some ways easier to ride than, than a, an 800 say, or a 600 where you've got to carry lots of corner speed. You've got to think on a thousand and, and, and tell yourself to be slow in the middle of the corner. And that's the sort of key to a fast lap time, but railing through a corner as fast as you can. I mean, there's a lot of fun in that, isn't it? And you know, when we when we first learned to ride motorbikes in our 50 days and our 125s, you know, with me and my friends anyway, it was all about how fast you could go around roundabouts and stuff. It's it's all about the speed and the lean, which ironically isn't the way really to go fast from from point to point or around a racetrack. But it's good fun anyway. But um, thank you very much for that question. Thank you very much for persevering 39 minutes of video. Um, but yeah, keep keep the questions coming in. I really enjoy uh, seeing them and answering them. And I will see you very soon.